Hello and welcome back to the second week of the Operations Research 1 course. So last week you have seen that uh, to formulate a linear programming, you need to have four characteristics of linear programming. The decision variables, the objective function, the constraints, and the sign restrictions. So this week we are going to look at some typical um, linear programming problem that might give you ideas on how to formulate a real-world problem into a linear programming problem. So let's take a look at the first typical problem that we call it as a diet problem. And by the way, this presentation corresponds to the textbook of Wayne Winston's Operations Research Applications and Algorithms on Chapter 3. The characteristic of this problem is that the decision maker has a set of requirements that he or she needs to satisfy. And the objective of the decision maker is to satisfy those requirements with the minimum cost. So let's take a look at an example of that problem. In somebody's diet plan, there are four foods that are available for consumption. Brownie, chocolate ice cream, cola, pineapple cheesecake. And then here you see um, this example says that I must ingest at least 500 calories, 6 ounces of chocolate, and so on. And then this example also provides a table that shows how many calories, chocolate, sugar, and fat for each of the type of the food. Um, what I'd like to say here or highlight here is that when you see the word I must, um, let me highlight that, I must ingest at least at least, at least, at least, you know that this sentence is about the constraint, right? Because um, it restricts the solution such that you must have at least 500 calories, 6 ounces of chocolate, and so on. So you know that this sentence, each day I must ingest at least so and so, it is about the constraint. And finally, you see that here the objective is to satisfy my nutritional requirements at minimum cost. As usual, I would like you to pause the video and read this problem carefully. So let's start formulating this problem into a linear programming problem by defining the decision variables and the objective function. Sometimes I start from the objective function because for me it's kind of clearer that the objective is about achieving a minimum cost. So what we need to do is to collect every single thing that talks about money. Okay, so here you see that each brownie costs 50 cents. Each scoop of chocolate ice cream costs 20 cents. Each bottle of cola costs 30 cents. And then each piece of pineapple cheesecake costs 80 cents. So all these things must go into the objective function. Why? Because the objective function is about minimizing the cost. So when we collect all those terms that are related to money, we can say that this 50 means 50 cents for each brownie that we buy or we eat. And then this is 20 cents for each scoop of chocolate ice cream that we eat. This is 30 cents for each bottle of cola that you drink. And then this is 80 cents for each piece of pineapple cheesecake. So what I do sometimes is I just put x1, x2, x3, and x4, and then define them later in the decision variables definitions. So here I define x1 equals to number of brownies eaten daily. Remember that you have to be very specific in the definition of the decision variables. So you must say the number of brownies eaten daily. Another example here x2 you must say the number of scoops of chocolate ice cream eaten daily. 
So you see that the definition is super specific. It doesn't say only cola, for example, but it says bottles of cola, drunk daily. So it's very specific, the number of bottles of cola that we drink daily. Okay, so I would like you to really um, keep this in mind that you need to define the decision variables as specific as possible. Now let's talk about the constraints. As I mentioned before the sentence, I must ingest at least 500 calories. It gives you the clue that this is about the constraint. Okay, from the table we see that these are the calories for each type of food. For example, when you eat a piece of brownie, you get 400 calories or so. This constraint says that whatever you eat, you must collect or ingest at least 500 calories. Now, if you think about our decision variables, how many brownie do you eat? Well, in the previous page, we define the number of brownies that we eat equals x1. Similarly, if I ask you how many scoops of chocolate ice cream do you eat daily? In the previous slide, you can see that you define it as x2. So x1, x2 are variables because we don't know yet what the values of those x1, x2. Right? That's why we call it a variable. And then how many bottles of cola that you are drinking? We don't know yet, but we have a notation for that, uh, which is X3. How many pieces of pineapple cheesecake that you eat? Again, we don't know yet, but we have a notation for that or a, ver or a variable for that, which is X4. So now the total cal calorie that you ingest for all this type of food equals 400 times x1 plus 200 times x2 plus 150 times x3 plus 500 times x4 must be greater than or equal to 500. Greater than or equal to because here it says at least so here it says at least so you must ingest at least 500 calories or more than that is also okay now the next constraint says that you must ingest at least six ounces of chocolate again we think about um, the same thing how many brownie do we eat x1 brownies we don't know yet what is x1 but we define that number to be x1 and then how many scoops of chocolate ice cream x2 scoops how many um, bottles of cola x3 bottles of cola and then x4 pieces of pineapple cheesecake so the, tot the total chocolate that you get from this must be greater than or equal to 6 and then this is how you write it 3x1 3 ounce of chocolate for times the number of brownie that you eat plus 2 ounce of chocolate times the number of scoops of chocolate ice cream that you eat so 3x1 plus 2x2 is the total chocolate that you get from all the food that you eat. Must be greater than or equal to 6. And then this problem says I must ingest at least 10 ounces of sugar. So very similar to before, you just um, think that for each piece of brownie you get 2 ounces of sugar and then you eat x1 pieces of brownie so the total sugar from brownie is 2 times x1 for each scoop of chocolate ice cream you get 2 ounce of sugar times how many scoops you eat and so on 
So this is the constraint for sugar. And finally, the problem says that we must ingest at least eight ounces of fat. So from each piece of brownie, we get two ounces of fat times how many pieces of brownie you eat and so on. So this is the constraint for fat. The total fat that you get from all the food that you're eating must be greater than or equal to eight. Finally, you need to put assign restrictions x1, x2, x3, and x4 must be greater than or equal to zero, which means that the amount of food that you eat must be zero or positive. You cannot eat minus three pieces of brownie. Okay, that's what this sign restrictions mean. And if we solve this problem, we're not talking about how to solve it yet, but if we solve it, then this is the optimal solution, which means that we need to eat three scoops of chocolate ice cream daily, and then we drink one bottle of cola, such that we will um, satisfy all these constraints, satisfy the sign restrictions as well, with the minimum cost of 90 cent. Now let me give you some questions to check your understanding. So given the formulation of a diet problem, and the optimal solution. There is a statement saying that the calorie constraint is a binding constraint. Is it true or false? I will give you the answer after the pause of the video. The answer is false. Because if you're plugging in this optimal solution into the calorie constraint, you can see that the left hand side does not equal to the right hand side. Therefore, the calorie constraint is a non-binding constraint. The second question, given the formulation and the optimal solution, there is a statement saying that the optimal diet provides 10 grams of sugar daily. Is it true or false? The answer is true. The optimal diet does provide 10 grams of sugar daily, which means you can also say that the sugar constraint is a binding constraint. So that's the end of this section and see you in the next one. Thank you.